Mike Johnson says he has to insist the U.S.-Mexico border be a top priority. Even as Chuck Schumer, others suggest that this is going to be a bipartisan agreement, they want to get a deal done. How hard is it going to be? It's hard to get something done on the border. You've seen it for years. You've seen Congress not be able to pass something. It's hard to get something done. However, let's go back to Iowa, where you and I were just a few days ago. Polls there showed that the immigration was among the top priorities. In some polls, it was the top priority. So therefore, this is one lawmakers know in terms of an election year and in terms of keeping the government funded. They have to get something done. The question is, how far will they go? What will they need for some type of an agreement that this can get passed? Kaylee? Well, Julie, I'm glad you bring up Iowa because Gregory Cordy was there with us as well. And Julie's absolutely right that when those caucus goers went to decide who they wanted to be the Republican nominee, they had border issues at the top of their mind, not just on the economy, as was the prevailing thought uh, beforehand. So doesn't that suggest that President Biden needs this just as badly as anyone else, that maybe he would be willing to make a deal here that he wouldn't have otherwise? I would think so. And you're right. It was surprising to us to see those numbers from the Associated Press vote cast poll four in 10 Iowans going to caucus and the Republican Party thought uh, immigration was the number one issue. And that's surprising because every other poll, including our own Bloomberg Morning Consult poll of swing state voters, shows it's far and away economy and inflation, those kinds of issues. So this is going to be a wake-up call for the White House. The question now is how badly do Republicans want to deal? Because this, if they see that this is an issue that's going to help them in the November presidential election, there might be less incentive to get a deal done and, and help to defuse that bomb for Biden in, in November if they think it's going to be Biden who's going to be blamed for the situation at the border. Well, and that's an excellent point. And I've asked this question to many people, Julie, this idea that will this Republican-controlled House of Representatives including leadership like Speaker Johnson, who have a very close relationship with former President Trump, who is assumed to be the general election uh, candidate against President Biden. Are they going to allow President Biden to have what he could call a win on border security? Well, I think I'm not sure they want President Biden to have a win on this. But on the flip side, if you keep saying no to deals in the Republican Party, deals that you say are so important to you, you have a problem too. So here's what they have to decide. What's more important, giving President Biden a loss on immigration or keeping the government funded? Because that will not bode well for anyone if the government shuts down. Well, of course, the other side of this border security negotiation is that it is an exchange, Gregory, for Ukraine funding. That is, is the deal here. So when we consider how... In an election year, legislators and the president are thinking about this issue. On the one hand, the president really does want to prioritize that foreign policy, and yet it doesn't seem like it's the foreign policy efforts, be it Ukraine, Israel, or others, that are actually the ones that will resonate at the ballot box. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, President Biden was in Congress for decades and knows how a deal gets done. And so he's tried to package this Ukraine uh, funding deal with some kind of a border deal. We just saw Speaker Johnson come out of that meeting at the White House. But there was a little bit of cross messaging between the White House and congressional leaders, uh, congressional Republicans. Uh, The White House seemed to think this was a meeting about Ukraine. To Speaker Johnson, it was a meeting about border, border, border. So it would be interesting to be a fly on the wall in that meeting to see how much of each topic got discussed because each one obviously has their priorities. They're going to have to bring them together eventually if a deal's going to come together. Eventually. I guess we're all waiting on the timeline, especially considering we could be facing a partial government shutdown if a continuing resolution plan doesn't actually pass in the next several days. When we think about the 2024 election, though, obviously all of these issues will color that outcome, but we are still in a primary fight, technically. Donald Trump is not the Republican nominee yet, and New Hampshire is just around the corner. After his decisive win in Iowa, we have new polling out, Gregory, from Suffolk University today, together with uh, some local outlets, NBC10, Boston, Boston Globe, etc., that show Trump at 50 percent and Nikki Haley 16 points behind him at 34 in the Granite State. Is this really as close a contest as Nikki Haley has been trying to paint that picture of? Well, a couple of things. First of all, look at the trend line, and you'll see that uh, Nikki Haley, since September, has been shooting up in New Hampshire. Uh, that, that trend line isn't moving up quite fast enough to catch Trump at this point. If, if the New Hampshire primary were held maybe next month, uh, maybe she would. But also, the, the New Hampshire voters haven't really had the chance to completely digest the Iowa results. What uh, New Hampshire 
voters tend to do is look at those three tickets out of Iowa that, that uh, we talk about. <laughs> That's Trump, Haley, and DeSantis. And they'll say, okay, Iowa, thank you very much for those three tickets. We'll take it from here. They're going to make their own decision. Uh, and so let's wait a couple of days to see how the polls are. The average in the Real Clear Politics average is 13, so it's a little bit closer. The magic number for Haley is to, she doesn't have to win New Hampshire, but she really does have to bring it within the low single digits to really make a statement that she's the contender here. Of course, Julie, the man who got the number two ticket out of Iowa was Ron DeSantis. And on that very same poll, he's down at 5 percent, low single digits. And Bloomberg is reporting today that he essentially is casting New Hampshire aside. He's focusing his staff, his efforts on South Carolina, Nikki Haley's home state, where she still is far behind President Trump in the polls. So is that the only viable path for the DeSantis campaign to move forward? It's South Carolina or maybe bust? Well, I think for the DeSantis campaign, I mean, if you look at the numbers, he's not going to come in second in New Hampshire unless something happens that none of us are expecting. So if he goes to South Carolina, again, Nikki Haley's home state, where she's coming in right now, polling, coming in second, he makes a dent there. That's really not good news for her. So I would imagine that that's why he made that type of decision. And also knowing that you're not going to win New Hampshire. The headlines aren't going to be good for you there anyway. Why not focus elsewhere? Well, it's also a question of resources, Julie. You brought us a discussion in Iowa with Roy Bailey, who's the co-chair of DeSantis Campaign's finances. He was saying, look, we're going through Super Tuesday. Yet simultaneously, Bloomberg's also reporting today that the primary super PAC backing DeSantis, never back down, is laying people off. That can't necessarily be a good sign. That's never a good sign when you see that. And you've also seen Never Back Down make a lot of changes throughout this campaign. So therefore, if you're looking at some financial problems, you're looking at a big loss possibly coming in New Hampshire, why not try something else if you do have limited resources to work with? Well, and of course, for Ron DeSantis, he had said previously, Gregory, that he was going to do some events in New Hampshire this week, one of them being a debate with Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley said... I will debate Trump or I will debate no one, essentially. She's backed out. That debate is canceled. What do you make of that decision, considering she, along with Ron DeSantis and others, have been calling out Trump for not debating? It was a little surprising just because Nikki Haley seems to have done very well in the debate so far this cycle. Every time she debated, you saw that trend line going up in, in her polling. Uh, but usually if you are, think you're, you're winning and think things are going well, you're, you don't have as much of uh, an incentive to debate. There's only risk and not reward. And of course, if you're behind, you won as many debates as possible because that's a chance to make up ground. Well, right. And she does have ground to make up if if the polling we're seeing today, at least, is is suggesting that if she can't do it in New Hampshire, I know you said she doesn't necessarily have to win. But if we're being realistic, if she doesn't win in New Hampshire, what stands in the way of Donald Trump being the nominee for the well, Republican Party? Well, one of the problems that both Haley and DeSantis has is not just that Trump is beating them both, but that they're so close together. Mm -hmm. There really wasn't a breakaway second place finisher in Iowa. Uh, they were separated only by two percentage points. And one of them has got to really emerge very quickly now as the alternative to Trump, because if we continue to split, see a split in the anti-Trump vote, the non-Trump vote in the Republican primaries, then we'll just have a replay of 2016 where uh, President Trump was able to divide and conquer the rest of the Republican field uh, all the way to the Republican nomination. 